Good morning, everybody. So as, as Claire announced uh, very clearly, I'm going to talk only about this very small part of the return to play uh, things we use, and that's going to be the performance tests. So, and I'm going to try to explain to you where are we? Are the tests we are doing good or are they not good? Or where are we exactly? Um, okay, so when we talk about return to play criteria, why do we use return to play criteria? Probably because we believe if our players succeed these criteria, it's safe for them to return to sport, right? Makes sense. Okay, so that's good. Safety is important. Last week, I was uh, riding my bike in the desert in Qatar, really true, on a Friday because there is no traffic and have these really nice roads. And this is what I found. And this is, shows you how important safety is. If not safe, don't do it. I don't know why they put it there. I don't know what it means. <laughs> but it's supposed to be important, right? Because actually, this is from the department of the, the complements of health, safety, and environment department. So safety is a big issue. All right. So when we say, OK, when we say safe, what do we mean by safety? So safe is not 100% safe, because every player on the pitch has a certain risk to have an injury. So the player you send back to the pitch has an equal amount of risk for an injury as the players who are already on the pitch and who were healthy. So it's not a 100% thing, it's the same risk as the ones who are on the pitch already. This is what we talk about safety. So concerning the performance test, we are actually saying that patients who reach the criteria of our performance tests and we send them to the pitch, their chance of getting a re-injury equals the chance of the other players on the pitch who have or might have a primary injury. Now, if we want to investigate this, and if I want to tell you, are we successful in reaching this yes or no, we need to have scientific evidence that is based on prospective research identifying risk factors for re-injuries. And I'll, I'll talk to that very briefly, just to show you how important it is. This is a study we did, and um, it's, it's one cohort here. You see the one cohort. And in, in this cohort, half of them had a hamstring injury, and half of them did not have a hamstring injury. If we compare those two groups, we are talking about retrospective data. And sometimes you see that patients who had a hamstring injury, but they're on the pitch now, these guys all are on the pitch now, these guys might have a difference from the ones who didn't have a hamstring injury. So it might be interesting information coming out of retrospective data. Now, when we follow up this group, and we follow them in time, you can do two things with it. You can do a prospective study, because we follow them up on time. We measure all the healthy guys, and some of the healthy guys get injured later on, and some of them, or most of them, stay healthy. And then you can compare the data you've been measuring before they were injured, in which, which way that the guys who get injured later on differs from the guys who are uh, not injured. And that is prospective data. And we did this in this cohort, um, uh, and that is prospective data on initial injuries, because you only take the guys who were not injured before, right? Now, what we really are interested, when we talk about return to play, you take only the cohort who had a hamstring injury history. And so not these guys we use in, in this data, we use the guys who had an injury before. And we say, which of them if we measure them, they're all playing again, but they all had injury, but some have a re-injury and some don't. Can we identify by forehand who will have a re-injury? And then we are talking about prospective data based on re-injuries. And we're using a different cohort. So we're not using this cohort for this, but we're using this cohort for this. So as a matter of fact, when we talk about the validity or when we talk about how far are we in predicting that our return to play criteria are good, 
we only can use this data to have a good idea about what it really is our criteria to return to sport. If we don't have this data, we can use this data or we can use this data. What we showed in this study and what we see in the literature, but this is a study, one of the few studies that has done retrospective study, prospective on initial injury and prospective studies on re-injuries in the same cohort. And what we showed is the findings here significantly differ from the findings here, and the findings here significantly different from the findings here. So the findings here doesn't say you anything about this, the findings here doesn't say you anything about this. So if you are interested in re-injury, which is re safe return to play, you have to use these data. Okay? You following me? All right. Now, when I'll talk about performance tests, I'll talk about two tests, or two groups of tests, one strength, and one kind of performance things. But uh, Mike will probably talk about more functional movement screens, et cetera, et cetera. So first we will talk about um, strength. And we have, the good thing is, now remember these colors, green, orange, red, I will refer to that in my next slides. So you see this line is green, which means we have some few data from the re-injury prospective studies, so that is good concerning strength. And what do we have on strength? Well, we have a few studies. We have a first study from Holland, where in hamstring injuries, they looked at re-injury group and the no re-injury group, but of course they had a primary injury, and they did find no significant difference in strength between both groups. Now, you see this is in red, meaning the, the, the amount of injuries is very low. So the power of this study is not very low, but it's showing us something that strength is not important, is not predicting a re-injury. And as you can see here, the mean was not significantly different between the ones who got a re-injury and the ones who didn't get a re-injury, but although the number of players with a bilateral deficit more than 10 degrees did not differ. So strength seems not to be very important. However, this is only one study. We did another study, and this is the study, and again, the, the numbers are not that high, but we did this test. It's a single leg bridging performance. It's a kind of a, of a strength test, but more functional. As you can see, you go from here to here. And we did not, this test was not identified as a risk factor for a re-injury. So the guys who had a re-injury later on did not have a worse score on that compared to the guys who did not have a re-injury. So again, showing that strength is maybe not so important. A third study I found is a study uh, we will publish uh, very soon on hamstring injuries again. And we've, we did not find that strength was a risk factor for re-injury. Again, low numbers. Three studies showing exactly the same, but it's only three studies, but it's the only ones we have, and the numbers are very low. There is a fourth study on ACL injuries, and yesterday you heard Harvard say, all, mentioning also a study which is coming. This is also a study on ACL uh, patients, and it's showing exactly the same. Low strength is not a risk factor for an ACL re-injury. The numbers are a little bit higher, but still we mu must be very cautious. Okay. This is the evidence we have concerning strength. What is the evidence with functional tests? And I will talk about the HOP test because this is the test most commonly used. Harvard and other speakers yesterday told you about the HOP tests and told you that uh, it's very frequently used and you have different uh, HOP tests. We have no, retro, uh, no prospective studies on re-injuries using the HOP tests. So that's where, so I could stop saying anything about HOP tests. However, if we say, okay, we don't have green light, maybe we have an orange light. Do we have an orange light? Yes, we have an orange light. We have several studies, and they all show that um, HOP tests cannot predict first-time injuries. Most of the studies show it, it's not useful in predicting injuries. Do we have something in the red light? Yes, we do have red lights. What is HOP test doing? Well, it can retrospective discriminate between people who had an injury and people who did not have an injury. But it doesn't tell you anything predictive at all. Okay? This is where HOP tests are. So what about other performance tests? And I'm, I'm not going to talk about the FMS, but other performance tests, and I put them all together. We have no data about them concerning re-injuries. 
What about Orange? Well, we do have some data, as you can see here, but these data all show that we have low or no evidence that any of the performance tests can predict injuries in the lower extremity. So no, it's not useful in predicting injury or not, uh, we don't know about re-injury. The only test which we know, and this comes closer to the FMS, is one study in 2006 where they identified a star exertion balance test, as you can see here, be able to predict injury. But this is only one study, and it's not been repeated by other studies. So I'm not quite sure if that is good evidence. So it's morning. Morning, we have to take a break a little bit faster. So halftime break. It doesn't mean you can get up and get out. No, 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 stay, but it's halftime break. And so we make a conclusion of what I've been telling you. First of all, we have some evidence about strength. But as you can see, all the evidence is pointing in the same direction. Negative, 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 negative. So strength seems to be not so much important. In other words, if you have this six-pack guy, or you have this six-pack, <laughs> it doesn't really matter in predicting re-injuries. So you, well, it's up to you which six-pack you have. I know which one I have, and I guess you know which one I have. And it's not the first one. Okay, so that's about strength. We have no evidence concerning performance tests that it does predict injuries. So we based upon these results, and of course it's scarce results, so we may have to be cautious, but based upon these results, we can say, and this is exactly what has been uh, published uh, very recently in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, isolated performance tests lack validity to predict injuries and re-injuries. So that's where we are. So, do we have to stop using performance tests now? No. Is isolated performance tests lack validity? What about return to play test batteries? And Harvard already uh, told you yesterday a study, and we did exactly the same study. We did a study on ACL re-injuries. So we, we follow up a group of 158 ACL injuries after their return to play. So we sent them back to the pitch, and we followed them up to see which of the guys had a re-injury and which of them don't have a re-injury in order to find some, some interesting things about it. So these were, were the guys, they were all professional athletes, all first ACL reconstruction, and almost all of them returned to their previous level. And the mean follow-up, as you can see here, is about two years. So these were the discharge tests we do, or we did. We do d different tests now, but anyway. So we did an isokinetic test at three speeds. We did several hop tests, and we did a running of a kind of an agility test. And these are the criteria the players had to reach before we send them to the pitch. In other words, we fully discharged them or not. If they succeeded on each of these individual performance tests, then they were sent to the pitch. If they succeeded on all or four of them, but they didn't miss or, or they missed one criteria, we didn't fully discharge them. Okay? This is important to know. However, of course, like always in life, some of the players were not fully discharged, but went to the pitch. So we said you couldn't go, but they went anyway. So what we did is compare these guys who met the criteria compared to the guys who didn't meet the criteria to find out if we had a difference in re-injury. And what did we find? This is uh, the re-injury level, this is the time course, and this is the amount of re-injury we had in our 158 group. So we have 26 re-injuries, which, which is a percentage of 16.5, which correlates very well with the rest of the literature. And these are the guys who went back fully discharged. Luckily, there were more than the ones who returned back not fully discharged. And these are the results. And as you can see clearly, we have 10% of the guys who were fully discharged who have a re-injury, but we have 33.3% of the guys who were not fully uh, discharged and having an ACL re-injury. This is a very, very important message to your players. If they go back to the pitch while they don't uh, reach all your criteria, they get a chance in one on three to get a re-injury. 
and they've just been rehabilitating for six, nine, ten months, and then they get a re-injury again. This is very important information to talk to your coaches, to your staff, to, to the players itself. So you have a more than three times higher chance to get injured. So our perspective study, and Harvard is, is showing exactly the same in uh, Norway together with, with Delaware, our perspective study is showing that risk factors for ACL uh, injury, that discharge test can be a predictive test. So, so yes, we are doing a good job. And I would say, I would say, hallelujah. Hallelujah! So I would like to, I, I've been giving you a bad message, a depressive message, like, oh, isolated performance tests are not good. Well, now I can say hallelujah, hallelujah. So stand up all together, and we all have to say hallelujah. It will make you feel good. Come on, come on. Let's go, stand up. So I'll go three, two, one, and then we say hallelujah. Yes, we can, okay? Three, two, one, okay. Hallelujah. Yes, we can. All right. So, okay, good. I think we're he helping our patients. So this is a good message. However, and I'm, I'm almost finished, however, did we find the holy grail now? Do we say, okay, if we do the whole test battery, we're, we're okay? Well, we are doing a good thing. I just let you say hallelujah, so, so it's good. You're feeling good. But I'm just mentioning one study we did to say we're not there completely, not yet completely. And this is a study we did, again on ACLs, and we looked at the cartilage status of these ACL patients when they returned to play. So they were all fully discharged. We said, based on our, upon our performance tests and other criteria, we said, yes, you can go to the pitch. But, so they were doing fine. All these cutting movements, all the performance tests, perfect. But we looked at their cartilage status. And how did you look at cartilage status? And I'm not going to go into detail, but we looked at the, the, morpho the, the morphology of it, the thickness, the, bi the biochemical composition with T2 mapping. So the quality, how good is the, the cartilage? We put in an MRI, 30 of them. We let them run half an hour, and then we put them in an MRI again, and then you can evaluate this, okay? And we also looked at in vivo behavioral uh, of, the, of the cartilage. And what is the conclusion of this study? And again, it's only on 30 subjects, but the conclusion of this study was that the cartilage was very fragile. It was not returned to its normal capacity. It had a, a very low behavioral or deformational behavior. In other words, your cartilage is not ready. Your player might be ready. You will test him with all the performance tests and he's doing great, hallelujah. But his cartilage cannot say anything about hallelujah. His cartilage is not ready. And this is maybe a problem. So, yes, we are doing a good job, but you have to think in the back of your mind, we are not measuring everything with performance tests, okay? So take home message. First of all, we hardly have any scientific evidence concerning the validity of the performance tests as part of the return to play. I showed you. So based upon that, we can say no single performance test is able to determine return to play. So if you want to send your players back to the pitch, don't use single performance test, but use a test battery. And then we are seeming to do uh, much better. So as you say, we have some indication, our study and the study of Harvard, that uh, the test battery as such, and we're all using about the same criteria, you, we've been talking about this yesterday and today, but in the literature, we're all using the same things. Well, the things you're using is quite okay. But, but, and you will probably laugh with this because it's, it's stupid and it's almost too stupid to tell you, but anyway, I'll tell you anyway, performance test, ladies and gentlemen, test performance. You say, yeah, probably that's why they call performance tests. Yeah, but that's what they're doing. They're not predicting injuries. They're just testing the performance of a player. Now, should we stop doing that? No, I don't think so, because it's very important. It's a conditio sine qua non. It is absolutely necessary that the performance of the players is good, but it's not enough. We need to do more than that. Otherwise, you will only test the performance. So I think we should do more. And what is, what is 
especially lacking in the performance tests we do at the moment, it is like the hop test. And you've been, we've been showing you hop tests all day long yesterday. Well, I don't know if it's a very spe sport-specific test. I don't know how many football players are playing football like this. <laughs> I haven't seen one. Well, not in Belgium, maybe in Switzerland, <laughs> they do. And that's, oh, 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 okay, we'll see at the, at the European Cup. But okay, so I'm telling you, hop test, is that a sp sport-specific test? I'm not quite sure why we do it. Because it's easy and we can measure it. Yeah, it's testing the hop test performance. But that's it. In addition, we do it when, we, we do it when the player is here, he warmed up, and then we do the hop test. But the injuries happen when players are fatigued. At the end of the game, after 45 minutes, after 90 minutes, then we have the high incidence of injuries. And I'm not quite sure if the performance on the hop test is still as good as in the beginning. So we should be testing much more endurance and fatigue. In addition to that, all performance tests are planned movements. In other words, you say to your player, okay, you stay here and you jump. You will jump. So he knows what he's supposed to do. Well, in football, if you're moving, you don't know what the opposite guy is doing. So you have to do an unanticipated movement. And that is the risk for an injury. We don't test it. We just say, sprint maximal. Okay, I'm going to do it now. Okay, I'll do it now. But if the ball moves in another direction, you need to do, to do a, a direction change. We don't test this. So we have to implement this. And of course, we have to look much more about the quality of the movement and not the quantity. I don't care that much how far they jump, but do, it, do they do it correct? Do they have compensations in their body, etc., etc.? These are the things, and some of you already are doing a good job on that, but I say I need to focus more on these items. So I hope I solved your problems. You don't go to home or to bed with a headache. I hope you have a problem, but to cheer you up, I have a slide of a guy who is probably at a higher chance of a re-injury than most of your patients, and that is because he has three legs. <laughs> so I don't know how much higher his chance is, but you can be lucky because you don't have this patient, okay? So it's to cheer you up. So thank you. Uh, anyway, I'll go back to the desert. I'm going to lay wait uh, in the sun a little bit like that. Or maybe I go back to my hometown, and there it's very nice. Thank you so much, and I'm not quite sure if we have time for questions. It's ready?